Hi, I'm Jonathan Abramowitz. I'm a clinical psychologist at the University of North Carolina, and I specialize in obsessive compulsive disorder and other problems with anxiety. And I'm the author of The Family Guide to Getting Over OCD. This is my newest book, and I'm very excited about it because it is for people who are living with someone who has OCD. Maybe your loved one is having difficulty making that decision to get help, or maybe they're getting treatment, but you want some help with how do I kind of assist with the, with the treatment. Now, if there's one thing that I've learned from all of my work on OCD, it's that OCD doesn't just affect the individual who has the diagnosis. It also affects family. Obsessions, compulsions, avoidance patterns, these things are relentless. And not only do they cause your loved one a lot of anxiety and distress and time and interference, but they also can cause your whole family a lot of frustration. Now, I know that you're probably tired of trying to convince your loved one with OCD that their obsessions and their compulsions and their avoidance patterns, their reassurance seeking, that all these things are, are senseless. And I know that it seems like just kind of using good reasoning and logic should set them on the right path. Of course, as you also know, that doesn't work. You can't just talk your loved one or reason with them or reassure them out of having OCD. It just doesn't work that way. And I also know that despite your best intentions, you might find yourself kind of giving in and accommodating your loved one's OCD symptoms. Maybe that seems to make life easier in the moment, but again, it probably leads to more frustration because it's not a good long-term solution. In my work and in this book, I teach family members how to support their loved one with OCD while also keeping their life and their family in balance. Now, this is not a simple task, but it really is possible to provide help and support to your loved one while not giving them help with their rituals. Instead, what you can do is learn how to help your loved one develop more independence, get better at tolerating anxiety, get better at tolerating their OCD triggers, and get better at tolerating their own unwanted distressing obsessional thoughts. One of the things I do in my book is I help the reader plan a program for how to step back and start to reduce accommodation. We do this gradually, and there are lots of skills that are important to learn about, you know, how do you manage when the person with OCD gets upset or makes threats, and that's all covered in the book too. But in this video, what I wanna do is just to go over one strategy that I recommend people follow when they begin to reduce accommodation, in particular, when they start to set goals for reducing accommodation. Specifically, I recommend thinking about the acronym SMART, S-M-A-R-T, when setting goals for reducing accommodation. This is gonna maximize your likelihood of success, and here's how it goes. S is for specific. Make your accommodation reduction goals as specific as possible. Simply saying my goal is to stop accommodating is, is too hazy. Instead, you might say something like, I'm going to stop checking locks and doors for Ariel. You see how that's much more specific? The other thing about a goal like that is that it rests on your own behavior and you've got a better chance of meeting your goals when they rely only on what you do rather than what someone else does because we just can't control other people. So try to choose goals that are gonna be based on what you can do. I'm leaving the house whether or not Brandon is ready when it's time to go is a good goal, as opposed to, Brandon must be ready at five o'clock when it's time to leave. You see how that depends more on Brandon's behavior than it does on your own behavior. So keep it specific and keep it focused on you. What can you do to change? Second, we have M. M stands for measurable. Your goals need to be something that you can tell if you've met them or not. Obviously, you need to know if you've succeeded or if you haven't. So choose concrete goals that you can keep track of. Stop throwing away items that Antonio says are contaminated. That's a real specific goal and you can tell very easily, did you throw away those items or did you not throw away those items? On the other hand, do a better job of not accommodating Antonio's OCD is much more kind of fuzzy and hazy. How will you decide if you've done a better job? What's your objective measure of better? How will you decide if something's better? Your best bet is to try to change behaviors that you can observe, directly observable behaviors. In other words, things that someone else would be able to see. 
Third is A, and A stands for achievable. Your goals should challenge you to stay committed and to work hard, but at the same time, you wanna keep them realistic. So if you set goals that just kind of push the envelope a little bit and stretch you a little bit, you're gonna work really hard, and your loved one too might work really hard to achieve those goals. If you set them too far out, then you might feel demoralized if you are having trouble and give up. So for example, I will never reassure my mother again, right? Never is a really strong word, and it's really hard to stay committed to that. On the other hand, I will stop answering my mother's texts in the middle of the night. That's a much more achievable goal that you can easily tell if you've succeeded or not, and it's also very specific. Next we have R. R stands for relevant. Your goals need to be tied to some sort of emotion. They need to be something that you're gonna work hard towards, that you feel is consistent with your values. So for example, what can you do that's gonna help your loved one develop more self-confidence and more independence when it comes to managing their OCD symptoms? You can also think about what's going to help you reduce your involvement in your loved one's OCD symptoms in ways that you feel are really important uh, for you. You can also set accommodation goals that are going to help to improve the quality of life in your family or in your house. Tying your accommodation reduction goals to one or more of these things is going to help you to be more successful. And then lastly, T is for time bound. Your goals need to have a time frame. So this means stipulating when are you going to change the behavior? When are you going to start? And when are you going to measure your degree of success? So for example, beginning tomorrow, I am going to stop answering my son's questions for reassurance. By specifying your goal, you make it a priority, and also your loved one understands what you're going to be doing and when you're going to be doing it. This can increase everyone's motivation. Goals without specific time frames are less likely to be met because it's easier to put them off. And it's important to understand that overcoming family accommodation is not easy. But remember that when you gently and firmly encourage your loved one to go towards the things that they're afraid of, rather than accommodating and helping them to avoid or do rituals, you can stop being controlled by their OCD and you can help them become more independent, self-sufficient, and develop better self-confidence in their own abilities to manage their OCD symptoms in a healthier way. Ultimately, this leads to better health your relationships and your whole family will grow more confident and more helpful. Hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching.